So it says recording is in progress. Oh yeah, yes, it, it records by default. Okay, so maybe we try without host. Yeah, as long as we're all here and you can see everything. I mean, I can't start, oh, there we go. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Uh, we'll be back, one sec. Nathan was having some trouble getting in. As, as host. Hey guys. Rachel, congratulations on the job. What is it? Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm working downtown at uh at Equitable. Nice. So that that started fantastic. Yeah, I'd say it was day number two. Um, do you mind sharing the position? Um, is this being recorded for the internet? Yeah, not yet. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. It it's recording right now. Does the chat get recorded? You know, I couldn't tell you. Hmm. Slack it to me, Artrell. Yeah. I'm just curious. How, how do you like it after day two? I like my I'll just put it in the chat so for everyone, whoever cares it, to know what I do. So since this doesn't go in the uh on YouTube. Um I like it. Is there's a lot to learn, definitely. You know, it's only day two. But um as I'm looking at things, you know, and I'm thinking like, how could I apply what I learned in class to this? And in time I think I'll be able to. You know, and there's one guy that helps us out with our stuff. And I think he's capable. I'm like, he's going to be my go-to guy. Nice. So I'm going to definitely great. try to learn from him and bounce stuff off of him, you know? That's I definitely, super That's dope. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah, because I definitely want to learn how to do more of like mapping and stuff like that for what we're doing. Because that might help us out when it comes to, you know, um, streamlining who gets paid, you know? Nice. So. Let's see. Uh, Long time no see. Yeah, how are you, Nathan? I'm good. How are you? Doing all right. Is uh is uh everybody feeling good about their capstone? Most of that. Mostly. The code's fighting with me a little bit, but hey, I'll win. But we've got, uh, but we've got some code, right? Folks have a little bit, mm -hmm. starting to get a little bit of code. All right, a lot of um, code. A lot. All right. Yeah. So let me let me pull the room real quick to show just by show of hands. Let's say I wasn't in Helena, Montana. I came to your house. I took your laptop, busted it over my knee. How many people in here would be in serious trouble? Man, do I have a story for you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yo, come on, come on. We last time I met, I showed you the foolproof way of of saving your laptop from Gatorade spills, nuclear disasters. Um, but, uh, oh, is that before I turn this is a promotional thing. Sorry. I said, is it like a promotional thing? Am I am I missing the the latest laptop cover or something? No. Um, when we did get uh, the last time that I met you, um, we uh, we were backing up all of our files to GitHub, just in case we accidentally broke our computers or lost something. Oh, that's right. You do wanna so scary. So my next question is, since the last time I saw all of you, how many people have done a git push? Oh, Doug, it, it doesn't count for you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't count. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just part of the job. <laughs> remind us, please. Please remind us. Or um, I guess I've, I've 
when I did my React project, I put it on GitHub. And okay. when I do an update, um, I actually do a push um, every so often, because if not, it takes way too long. And then uh, before I finish my project, I always do um, save everything and do a push to make sure that I have the latest for my React on the capstone. But I think it's only doing the capstone um, code. It's not the server or back end. Okay. My okay. game has saved me like, um, what? couple days ago when I completely nuked my project messing with the terminal and I was like well let me see what github has and it had like not up-to-date code but it was better than starting all over so that's Good. It. hey that's a win in my opinion if it's if it's helping you uh helping you get back to uh within the last couple of days I mean I, I don't know of any any better scenario than that yeah I agreed I was like you know what I'm gonna just take this and continue yeah Excellent, excellent. So today is um, uh, actually. Do you have a question, Archie? I didn't mean to raise my hand. I did a visit. I actually raised my hand, and it somehow I came up. I don't know. I'm sorry. No, nope, no worries. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to quickly um, we're going to quickly recall a bit of the Git work. Um, that we did the last time that we met. Um, so this is just kind of going to be an easy refresher just to get get um, folks reacquainted with using Git. The reason why um, why we're bringing it up though, when I when I first when we first spent a week together, um, Git was kind of viewed as this nice to have tool. We were mainly looking at it through the lens of um, disaster recovery. What happens if our laptops are destroyed? Or what happens if I run RM, RF in the terminal and nuke, uh, and nuke some folders accidentally? So we were primarily looking at it through those lenses. We were also looking at it as a mechanism for deploying to GitHub pages. Have, have people been using GitHub pages for their portfolio? Has anybody continued to do any development on their GitHub pages? No, okay. Well, um, um, I'm not, I'm actually, we're gonna stop talking about GitHub pages this week and we're gonna talk about uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, if anybody is interested in continuing to use GitHub pages, um, I'm more than happy to talk about that at office hours, but um, uh, GitHub pages, we were using Git in order to, um, in order to deploy our portfolio sites to, um, to a website. If you recall, uh, back when we last met, um, we were uh, committing our code, pushing it up, and then GitHub Pages was taking the rest. Um, and we linked up our name chief domains with GitHub Pages. Remember that whole fiasco where we were requesting SSL certificates by checking that box, um, waiting to see if uh, the C name uh, DNS records had resolved. Well, we're gonna we're gonna build on top of that. Um, we're gonna continue to use Git um, to uh, back up our code and to practice version uh, version controlling. But um, later on, um, we're going to actually use Git to do um, some, some something similar that we did last time, where we commit our code, push it up to GitHub, and then GitHub is going to take uh, take that code and deploy it um, to some servers. Now. Things are a little bit more complex since the last time that, that we've met. Um, last time that we've met, uh, nobody had written, I don't think anybody had written any JavaScript. So now that I'm talking to all of you, you're, um, you got some JavaScript under your belt. Not only do you have front-end JavaScript, uh, well, not only front-end JavaScript, but you also have uh, JSX under your belt. Um, you also have uh, uh, some knowledge of the React framework. Um, and more importantly, in my opinion, you have some backend knowledge. You know some server-side JavaScript. Um, so that makes deployment a little bit more tricky. Um, getting, our, getting our code in front of customers, it's not just simple uh, HTML anymore in CSS. You've got JavaScript on the front end. You also have uh, server-side JavaScript to run. In addition, 
Uh, I'm missing one big piece here. Anybody know the uh, other real big piece we have to concern ourselves with? Security, I'm guessing, like the passwords and stuff? That's, uh, we will cover that um, at the, close to the end of next week. Um, but I'm talking about kind of the big moving pieces that we need to have in place in order to get our capstones uh, live on the internet. We've got, uh, if we just kind of think of like the really big moving pieces, we have uh, front end code, which is um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, Augur, React, um, any images, et cetera. Then we have the back end, which uh, is kind of like our Node.js uh, server code. And then I'm thinking of one other really big piece for the back end. The database? The database. Okay. The database. Yep, exactly. Um, so y'all are bringing a lot of baggage this week. Uh, since the last time that we, that we spoke, you know, you're, you're working with really simple stuff. Now you've graduated to, you've got a lot of moving pieces. You've got a lot of complexity um, in your stack. So we've got we've to accommodate for all of that this week. Um, and we got to figure out how we're going to take all of those pieces and get them deployed out on the internet. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and jump into it. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Not that one, let's sit over this one. All right. Can everybody see my slide, slide window? All right, cool. Uh, hi, my name is Nathan Evans. I am the one instructor that's not in New York City. Uh, I live uh, over there. Doug. Would you like to reintroduce yourself? Uh, I'm still Doug. Uh, <laughs> you may remember me from earlier this earlier this cohort. I graduated last cohort, and uh, so I'm. You guys are probably the way that you're so deep into the full stack right now. You could give me some refreshers, but. Uh, here to help. Cool. I'm still Jen. Oh yeah. Does everybody want to everybody want to reintroduce her? <laughs> no, I, I threw these up at the top because uh um just for legacy purposes. Okay, we've already talked um we've already talked a little bit about this, but just to uh, just to reiterate, uh today is mostly getting our feet um uh feet wet with Git again, and then we're gonna start deploying stuff to AWS. But just like last time, the real goal for the end of our time together is really to have capstones ready for graduation. Um, to that end, I have come up with a, I think I showed this last time, or at least a version of this from last time. Um, so we're going to use this website, cohort4.com. We're going to use this to track all of our progress. Uh, like I said, we've got a bunch of moving pieces that we have to get in place in order for our capstone to, to function properly. As you can see, there's I've got everybody in here, um, everybody mapped by their GitHub username. Um, and we have each of these different steps that we're going to go through in order to try to, uh, to get our capstones. Sorry, we're not going to try. We're going to get our capstones, uh, capstones up and running. Um, and so the first part we're going to kind of be focused on today is the um, is the blog uh, front end. Uh, but uh, feel free to check this out and um, use this to to reference your progress um, during the week. Okay. So um, before we get any further, can someone tell me the difference between Git and GitHub? Um, I guess I'll take a stab. Uh, I think like Git is like a, a system of handling um, files, sharing, um, you know, file updates and things like that. Where the GitHub is like a place to store that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, 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 that's
you're you're exactly right. It's kind of like the difference between email and Gmail. Like, um, you know, email is kind of the uh, the specification. It's the um, it's the way that we communicate uh, by sending files to one another. Um, Gmail is kind of the place where you can host it. Now, Gmail is not the only email provider. There's also, you know, any number of other um, email providers out there. Same thing with Git. Git is the underlying technology. It's the um, it's the actual tool. And GitHub, we are just we're just picking GitHub because um, uh, just because they're um, easy easy to use. There's also GitLab, um, Git. There's uh, there's uh, some other ones. So, um, yeah, Atlassian, Bitbucket's another another pre pretty big one. GitLab is is also pretty big. Um, we're just going with GitHub. Now, I'm not going to go through, but um, the link to the slides are in, is in the outline, and I'll post these slides in Zoom chat real quick, just to make sure that for the folks that want to follow along, you have the. You have the ability to follow along in the slides, but um, if there's specific things with GitHub that you're interested in revisiting, um, specific things with uh, with using Git that you're interested in revisiting, uh, feel free to click on these. These are just going to link you back to the slides where we talked about them last. Um, but we're going to also cover this in class. Um, this is more just here for your reference. Okay, and then for the terminology, just a quick refresher on the words that we're kind of throwing around. Remember that repo is um, repo is a it's it's really two things. It's a special folder that's on your computer. So when you clone down a repo, that's taking some code from the internet, it's putting it on your computer. Um, so first first and foremost, it's a special folder on your computer, but it's also a location um, uh, on on GitHub or GitLab or whichever one of those uh, services you use. So a repo kind of means two things. It's something on your computer and it's something in the cloud. And then when we do pushes and pulls, when we do a git push, we're taking what's on our special um, folder on our computer and we're pushing it, we're backing it up uh, to the cloud. So um, repo, we, we're, we throw around repo a lot. I'm also guilty of saying things like project, um, but repo is kind of the correct term to be using when, you, when, you, um, when you're talking about that special folder. And then commits, when, whenever we have some code and we make changes to it, we would go into GitHub desktop, we would go down to the bottom, we would describe our changes, we'd hit that commit button, and then we push it up. Um, remember that or recall that commits are those little snapshots of changes that you make to the code. Um, we went through, last time we met, we went through different scenarios for undoing commits. Um, like uh, in a situation where you made a change that you didn't want, you could back up and revert commits. So think of commits as um, little snapshots in time um, that when um, you make a bunch of commits, they all add up to, um, a series of changes that you're making to your code. And we'll uh, we'll revisit that here in a minute. Uh, push, yeah, this is just kind of intuitive. Uh, everyone should feel familiar with this, taking um, all the commits, all the progress that you've made on your repo, taking all of that from your machine, pushing it up to the cloud. Uh, clone, we've already talked about. And then fork, um, Fork is, is a, a situation where you're working on someone else's project. So it's, it's not something that you've created, but so, someone else's project. Um, you can make a copy of their project and then work on it um, uh, on your own. Uh, but we, we won't really deal with fork, fork a whole lot. All right, so we have two sets, four total. We have two sets of repos that we're going to create today. Um, and that's going <clears> to... <throat> The overall strategy uh, for the next couple of weeks is we're going to, in class, we're going to practice on the blog. And the reason why we're going to practice on the blog and not on our capstone directly in class is because um, 
everyone's capstone might be in a different state right now. Um, some people's capstone might not be hooked up to the database. Some people's capstone might not have a working front end or a working um, authentication uh, layer on the back end. Um, so what we're going to do in class is we're going to work on the blog code, get the blog deployed, and then um, for homework and any additional class time that we have, uh, we'll also work on the capstone. Um, so today, what we're going to do is we're going to create two sets of repos. We're going to create the blog repos primarily, and then if we have time, we'll also create the capstone repos. And when I say sets of repos for total, I mean that we're going to create a repo for our front end and back end code. So um, we're not going to jam uh, all of our code into one repo. We're going to create individual repos for our front end React and then um, repos for our server side, our back end code. Okay. All right, let's get the cobwebs dusted off. Let's go ahead and get GitHub Desktop opened and make sure that we have it installed. I actually haven't touched GitHub Desktop in a long time and I had to re-download it. Um, so um, make sure that your GitHub Desktop is working and you're able to log in. You might not see a screen like this. In fact, I'm hoping that you don't see a screen like this. You'll probably see something more like um, Let me close down something really quick. You should you should see something a little bit more like this. And that's because you're probably already inside of a repository in GitHub Desktop. That's good. Um, Jordan? Uh, mine said you should move it to trash. I'm sorry, what do I do? Is it say it's damaged or something? Or yeah. corrupt? Yeah, I had the same thing happen. I don't know what they've done. Uh, yeah, throw it in the trash and go grab a new copy. Um, here is... Oh, that's just a link to my slides. Just Google um, GitHub Desktop and I'll grab the link from this. Okay. Oh, just copy that link. Yeah, for anybody that has a busted version of GitHub Desktop, which totally happened to me, um, click that link and you should get a new copy. Uh, Mine says error, command failed. Applications, GitHub, desktop, so on, merged main. Um, so you're able to get GitHub desktop open? Well, I clicked it from the from the, my, my tray in the bottom. It popped up, but it's an error message. It said the command oh. failed. Um, can you share your screen really quick and show us what you got? Absolutely. Some people have it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do a closed caption. I meant to do screen share. All right. Command failed, merge main. Uh, just hit close. So I hit close. I keep doing that. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, so it looks like it's trying to merge in. Um, yes, kill it. Um, uh, activity manager, or yeah, can you X from there? Uh, if you do you know? command option escape, you can do a force quit. All right, command option quit. Command option escape. Yep. Oh, escape. All right, thank you. Oh, nice. Okay. Let's see what happens. All right. So I'm going to try to, uh, it's not on the bottom anymore. <laughs> so you can get to it with, with Spotlight if you want. It. That works too. Yep. Get a desktop. Oh, I see my other screen. Just bear with me. Hey, it's not, not throwing the air, seam air. Cool. Uh, All right. 
so I think, uh, is anybody else having difficulty reviving their GitHub desktop? Okay. Um, let me go back to share my screen. All right. So you should see something similar to this. If you don't see exactly this, it's not a big deal. Um, we are, you might be selected on a repository. Probably you're selected on your, your portfolio repository. Um, we're going to switch off of that to our blog repository here in a moment. Okay. So we're going to start off with um, creating blog repos. And we want two, two repos for this. So there's um, any number of ways that we can go about doing this, but the simplest is to go to GitHub and create these, um, create these through github.com. So in a browser, open up a window, go to github.com. And then up in the top right is the plus button. We're going to go and create a new repository. And I'll wait a minute for folks to get to this page. Here's the link if you want to go directly to the new repository page. So um, will I be in the old one where it says my name dot github dot io uh in github desktop are you talking about in github desktop so we're going to be in oh we're in desktop not the web one no um you should be over in the web one so we're going to create a new repository we're ignoring the old repositories we've made we're going to create a new one. Oh, i see what you mean okay All right, so on this page, github.com slash new, you should see something similar. Um, the owner should be your GitHub username. And then for the repository name, let's start with the front end. So let's make a repository, call it blog dash front end. Okay. And then make sure that we set it to public. And then can anyone tell me the last crucial step here before we create this? Does anybody remember? The readme file? Exactly. Yep. Make sure that you check the add a readme file. Exactly. And what is the significance of checking that, Nathan? Yeah, good question. Um, if you don't initialize the repository with something, either a readme file or a git ignore or a license. If you don't initialize it with anything, you will get an empty repo and you have to do very uh, tedious things um, to initialize it. Um, if you just click the box, add a readme file, GitHub will put a file into your repo when it creates it, which makes it drastically easier to get started with. Uh, question, Shiner? Yeah, could you uh, touch on the git ignore? I ran into a problem with my um, pushing to origin. You know how you got to deal with the node modules and that whole yeah. headache? Yeah, yeah. So um, Max introduced the git ignore and that fixed mm -hmm. it. I don't 100% understand it. Yeah. So it, it's actually, let's do this. Uh, since we're doing the front end here and we're going to put JavaScript code in here, let's add a git ignore. So when it, uh, where it says add git ignore, click on the git ignore template and then let's put in a JavaScript, no, uh, not node. Huh? Let's see which ones they have available. So I'm thinking node is probably our best bet here. These look like a bunch, these are just a bunch of templates that GitHub offers. Yeah. So for the git ignore, <laughs> type in node. And let's all put in a node get ignore template. Okay. 
So if if you've done this correctly, you should have blog front end as the repository name, blog dash front end. Um, it should be set to public. You should add a readme file. And we're going to add a git ignore, a node git ignore. And then click create repository. All right. Now, if my code uh, on the deploy board is working, we should see some stuff go green here in a second. Um, all right, the git ignore, let's talk about that real quick. So notice how we have an empty repo here uh, or a brand new repo called blog front end. Yours is going to say your GitHub username slash blog front end. Notice how we have a readme file and then we also have a git ignore. If we click on the git ignore, you see it's filled in with a bunch of stuff. Um, notably down on line 41, there's an entry for node modules. Uh, so Schneider, to answer your, your question, um, the git ignore ignores uh, anything that's in this file. So anything that's in your folder on your computer, um, your repo folder on your computer, if it contains any file that is named any of these um, entries in this file, if it matches any of these names in here, Git will ignore them. So Git won't try to bundle them up into commits and push them, which is useful because node modules is very large and is a bunch of other people's code. And you don't really want to push that to GitHub. So the Git ignore just lets you specify a bunch of file names for things that you want Git to ignore and not push. We picked a node git ignore. This is just a template that GitHub offers and it has a bunch of common um, files that node will produce. Um, and uh, that's, that's how all of this is generated. All right. Hey, we got some people's stuff going green. And it looks like I have a bug where my column was uh, incorrectly named back end when it should have been named front end. But it looks like. Uh, Jordan, sorry, did I get ahead? No, sorry, mine had just, for some reason, I think it's my internet, but it um, had just finished downloading and you had already gone past it. So I didn't want to like interrupt. Oh, no worries. Um, did you open GitHub Desktop? Are you logged into it? Okay, GitHub Desktop is open. Um, it had my old repository open, so I had to close that down. And now what do I do? Create a new repository on your hard drive? So leave GitHub Desktop. So now that GitHub Desktop is working, leave it alone, hop into, a, hop into the browser and go to github.com and create a new repository on the website. So that github.com slash new should be what you're seeing in, in the browser. Yeah, I got to send in. I'm sorry. Yep, no worries. Okay, and then repository name. Uh, it should be blog dash front end. So it should look like this. Uh, description, I don't need one. Public, you said? Public and check the add a readme file. Okay. And if you would like, you can add a node git ignore template. I'm sorry, um, I can add a what? You can add a node git ignore template. So in that git ignore drop down, type in node, check it, and then you're good to go. Hit create repository. Word, thank you. Cool. Um, 
Bobby, is Exo not here today? Jordan's looking good. Therese. Nice. That one just went green. Therese, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I actually am not home right now. I'm just kind of following along oh. today. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. Uh, Schneider, are you doing okay? I mean, it's created, so I don't know why it's not green. Well, let's Wait check it out. Wait a minute. Did we create the front end or back end? You created it. It's blog dash front end, and my automation isn't picking it up because of the trailing dash. Gotcha. I'll edit it. Cool. Uh, Niasia? Is Niasia here? Sorry, I can't see everyone is, uh... no, okay. Um... All right, cool. So part one, done. Um, we will go ahead and link this up with our computers here in a minute. Um, let's just go ahead and jump to doing the back end. So staying on github.com, let's go back up here to the top right, new repository again. Blog dash backend. Same settings. Public readme. Add a node. Get ignore. Click create. We used to get ignore again. Yeah, let's make another get ignore. Let's do uh, let's do another node get ignore for our back end. Excuse me. All right, let's see who's gonna who's gonna get second. Oh, it's a tie between uh, Kalai and Jennifer. Yeah. Oh, wow. A lot of people coming in uh, in second place. Cool. All right. So we've successfully created blog backend, the blog front end. Uh, let's go through the steps for cloning down this two repo. So we have them on github.com. Now we need to take them from github.com and get them pulled down to our machine. Now, uh, when we pull from github.com, those two repos that we created, when we pull them down, when we clone them down to our machine, what should we see inside of those repos? Does anybody know what we'll we'll see on our on our computer? What those two repos will contain? Probably just a README file. A README file. Yep. And one more. Get ignore. It get ignore. Yep. It will be those two files. All right. So let's. Let's walk through uh, again the steps to clone down those repositories. So if you have your GitHub desktop, um, if your screen looks like this, I'm, I'm assuming that some people will have uh, their screens looking uh, slightly different, but for most folks, you should be able to go up here to the top left. This might be your GitHub IO. This might be your portfolio repository. Click on this uh, repo picker, click the add button, clone repository. And then you can do this any number of ways. The easiest way to do it is to click on the github.com and then start typing in blog front end or back end. Let's start with the front end. If you don't see blog front end showing up here, there's a little refresh uh, icon. Click that uh, to fetch a list of all the repos. But clone down the blog front end repo.
your screen should change uh, to something like this. And then you don't have to do this on your end, but I'm going to click the show in Finder and notice how when I click the show in Finder, all I see is a readme.md, but that's because on my computer I have hidden files uh, not shown. So the dot give ignore is, is not showing up here. Um, if I go to this folder in my terminal, however, and I do an ls, I have two files. Well, I have three. I have a git folder, a git ignore, and a readme. Okay. So we should be at the point where we've downloaded, we've cloned down the log front end. Let's go ahead and clone down the back end. So I'm going to go back to click on the same repo picker, hit the add button, clone repository, log back in, clone. Now you should be able to switch between blog backend and blog front end through this picker. You should be able to switch between these two re repositories on your computer. So your computer is now in sync with what you've created on github.com. Uh, Naj, you have something? Yeah, mine says that my um, front end contains files and it can only clone empty folders. Can you share your screen? Let me stop. Um, contains files, can only clone empty folders. Oh, um, hit cancel. Go, um, open up. Oh, you've got blog front end already. So click add. Yep, click add. Let's go get the back end, clone repository, blog back end. Okay. Hello. It was upset because it was like, no, blog front end already exists. Okay. Y'all caught up? Yes. Um, anybody else? All good? I mean, I don't know if it was a big deal or not, but um, my uh, Git ignores are not showing up. Um, For the same reason, it's not showing up in Finder. Through the terminal. Oh, it's not showing up in the terminal. No, Did you do an LS? Yeah. Do an I, LS deep in there. Do an LS dash A. LS dash A. What the okay. Oh, that's cool. Okay, I see enough. Nice. Um, all right. So that's the easy part. Um now we got we got some file shuffling to do. So we're gonna need to copy some files in. If you don't have a copy of the blog. Um, I have a link prepared for you to download these files. Here is a link to the blog files. That has a zip um, that you can, well, I'll just click it on my machine and follow along. Um, once you open that link, click that download button in the top right little da download icon. It'll give you a zip file. And once you open up that zip file, you should see a blog backend and blog front end folders. This is the code we're going to rip off of Max and deploy. Is anybody, are you guys, is everybody already familiar with the blog code? Have you been using this in class already? Okay, so so maybe maybe don't use my zip if you're feeling uh, more comfortable with using your version of the blog. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you had a link to some code that I know actually works um, just in case. So feel free to use whichever version of the blog backend you want. Okay. <laughs> So let's let's keep doing this in order. We'll keep doing front end first, and then we'll we'll come back and work on the back end. Um, 
So let's start with the front end. I'm going to keep a finder window open um, over here. And I'm going to go to GitHub Desktop. So I've got my, oops. And I'll pause here in a second so everybody can catch up with me. Blog front end, have that code from the zip file or wherever your blog front end code is on your machine. Get that open on the right. Um, make sure that make sure that you're looking at something similar to, to what you see on my screen. Um, it, you'll know you're in the right spot for the blog front end code if you see a directory called src and a package.json. You'll know you're in the wrong place if you don't see that. Like for example, I can see blog back end and blog front end. That's not what I want to be looking at. I want to be looking at the front end code. So looking at package.json, um, src, you might have more files, um, but really we want to make sure that we're sitting at the top of the front end folder. Okay. Anybody having difficulty finding some blog front end code? Getting a, getting a finder window open? Mm. Okay, uh, so just kind, just kind of a quick question. I'm, I'm sorry. I did notice that you, you don't have your node modules, and we normally do that too before we like Max will have us uh, delete it. Um, if we're copying it over or something, and then he'll have us install the node mm -hmm. modules again once we. Now, are we going to have to do that here? Should we, because for instance, my blog front end, um, I'm using the one that we used before. Mine has no modules. Should I delete no yeah. modules before we do whatever we do with it? Or Good, good, good catch. Um, yes, let's save time because we're about to copy files from one to the other. Yeah, great catch. Nuke the node modules. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be sitting there waiting for files to copy. Um, so if you, if you do have node modules over here, nuke them. Good call. If you don't have node modules, um, one of the reasons why you might not have node modules is because you downloaded the zip just like I did and you haven't had a chance to NPM install. But if you don't have node modules, that's not the end of the world either. Okay. So the, the git ignore node won't stop those from copying? Um, it will stop us from pushing it up. It will stop us from committing, but I, um, we're about to copy on our local um, drive from one location to another. We're about to take um, we're about to take our code that wasn't in a special Git repository, and we're about to move it into a special Git repository. Um, so in that case, the Git ignore will apply uh, in that transfer from being outside of Git to all of a sudden it's inside of Git. Understood. All, just from just from Git to Git, will it work? Will it ignore? Exactly. Yep. Yep. All right. So uh, on the right, you should have a finder window with some kind of blog front end code. And this uh, finder window is not in a Git repo. It's not in a special folder. Um, so we're going to go and upgrade it. We're going to go and move it into, um, into our repository. To do that, let's have our GitHub desktop window open on the, on the other side. And right now, I'm selected on the blog back end. I need to go and switch to the front end because we're working on front end code. All right. So you should have blog front end, some front end code. The last thing we're we're going to do to get ready to copy things over is we're going to click show in finder again, but we're going to do it from the GitHub desktop side. So now we should have two finder windows open, our blog front end code, and then our special uh, our special blog front end uh, repo folder. And we're gonna just drag over. Or copy or copy and paste, whatever gets the job done. I don't know why my, oops. Wait, that second finder that you just opened for the repo, where do we, where, where does that come from? Um, so that comes from, that comes from uh, being over here in GitHub Desktop. Let me quick. Let me get back quick. Discard all changes. Um, so you should be you should be looking at the blog front end 
And then to open up the special finder window for um, your GitHub desktop repo, click the show and finder button here. Do you see that? Uh, you're muted. Yeah, so I opened it in that and you said we should have the readme.md in there? Um, yeah, there's going to only be one file in there. It's going to say uh, readme.md. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then what do I do? Sorry. Um, well, so I've, I've screwed things up on my end, um, copying things over. Uh, please bear with me for a second. Fair. I'm going to delete that. Let me open this. All right, so you should see something a little bit like this. Um, over on the right, you should have your copy of blog front end code. Over on the left, you should have just a readme.md. Um, so for folks that haven't copied things over into their GitHub repository, um, this is this is what you should see. Does that look uh, similar to what you have, Jordan? Cool. Um, okay, so grab all the stuff from where your blog front end code was, drag it over. Um, I have this little window that popped up that I did not see. It's saying that readme.md already exists in this location. Do you want to replace it? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to allow it to be replaced. Okay. And now the GitHub desktop window should change. Should It should think that you're adding a ton of files, which you are. You're copying a bunch of, of new files into your GitHub repo. So if you're seeing this in your GitHub desktop window, you're right on. Uh, Jennifer? Hi, thanks. Um, I'm not sure I have my front end in the right place because I opened it up and... Um, Do you want to share? Is it just GitHub readme file? <clears throat> You should only see a README file in your GitHub repo um, because that's the only file that was created when we when we made it. Um, if you share your screen, it will um, we might be able to. Yeah, sorry, I'm just not sure what happened because it looks like the same thing when I open up the file finder through GitHub. Right. So um, you're in your working copy on the right, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's your there's your blog front end code. Great. Over on the left, all you have is um, over on the left. Let's make sure um, in the GitHub folder. This is in your documents, right? Desktop. Um, okay, click back behind you to the GitHub desktop, and then click the show finder. Cool. All right. So this is the back end. So click behind you again. Pick what? Uh, click back behind you back to your GitHub desktop. Mm -hmm. All right. Change the blog back end to the front end. Uh, to do that, click the add button. Clone. Yep. Clone. Wait, I already had done that, but I guess it didn't work. And then, yep, clone. Perfect. Now you've got the front end. Um, on your machine. Let's hit that show and find her one more time. Okay. And then grab all of this stuff, put it right there. That's going to say a window should have just popped up. Look on your other monitor before you drop again. Um, oh, okay. I think that's good. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's good. I think you I think you did it. You're you're in the right spot. Great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yep. Um anybody else have problems getting to this? Yeah. Um I'm on the blog front end in the GitHub. Um Can you share your screen?
blog front end. Okay, you have an initial commit, that's fine. Um, show me, so you have an initial commit, right? Um, that's what GitHub automatically generates for you. Okay, here's your front end code from your computer. Um, so let's move that over a little bit to the right and just leave that window there. That makes sense. Um, click back behind you to the GitHub desktop and click on uh, changes tab. Okay, cool. Um, let's uh, right click on this one changed file. Let's get rid of this little, yep, discard. Yep, discard. Cool. Show and finder. All right, now we're we're at where we need to be. Yep, exactly. Take those five things. Do I need to do the README too? Um, why not? I think if you carefully aim for right here, it will it will work. Oh, nice. That works too. Okay. Um, all right. Click back behind you to GitHub Desktop. Let's see if it's smart enough to know. Sure is. Uh, it recognized that you added a bunch of files. Um, all right. Anybody else not seeing uh, something similar where they've got a bunch of files getting added? I have a question. Yeah, please. I. I moved mine instead of copying mine. Should I have copied it? Uh, if you don't care about losing your copy wherever it was, then uh, you're good. I was actually dragging, so I was also moving. I tell you, you can also grab a copy of Max's from the website. What I actually did, I just, I figured I made a mistake. So I just copied what I moved over and put it back in. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. You should be all good. Yeah. I'm not. So I copied yeah. it again once I moved it over to my, my Git, Jordan. And then I put it back into the, the original folder. But I was just, I was just curious to make sure, you know, if it was completely a move or just a copy. Either one works. Um, okay. All right. Anybody else? Otherwise, let's move on to our first commit in several weeks. Switch back. All right, so you should see something similar to this where it's saying uh, you have roughly 27 something files um, being added. So let's commit and push uh, down here in the bottom. Let's enter in a quick summary and say something like um, initial load of blog and then commit to main. Push origin. From here on out, we're going to work on the code in this folder for for the front end to get to the to get to the code. Well, let me ask: How do we get to the code? How do we start working on our front end block front end code? You can um, open it through Reveal and Finder, right? That's what I usually do. You can. I oh, meant VS Code. It's there. Um, you go on the GitHub. Um, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> You could go to GitHub desktop and open in Visual Studio code through there. Perfect. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Um, now, one thing to be aware of, if you've been working on the blog, blog which I know um, everyone has, you might have the blog already open. Um, so just to make sure that we open up the correct blog front end, let's, let's quit out of... Um, Let's quit out of VS Code and reopen it. So to do that, um, you can hit Command Q, um, do whatever you need to to get out of VS Code. I'm going to close my VS Code completely. And then I'm going to click on this button, open in VS Code. I'm going to open it up again. And that should, um, that should ensure that I'm in the right spot. Alternatively, you can click Show in Finder. And then you can um, drag and drop files 
that whole approach still works for opening things. But uh, all right, so we've got the blog front end. Um, this file wants to keep getting added whenever you open a thing with Finder. All right, we have our code up on blog front end. Let's rinse and repeat for the back end. So switch over to the blog back end. And then I'm going to do the same setup. I'm going to go and open, I'm going to go to my downloads folder. I'm going to go and open up the zip. I'm going to find the back end code. I'm going to put that over on my right. Code finder on the left. We got rate limited. So making calls to uh, look to see if everyone has created uh, backends, we got, my program got rate limited. They told me I was making too many API calls and I need to stop. So unfortunately, uh, I will no longer be able to track whether folks have created their GitHub blogs. I will fix that later. All right. If uh, if you did everything correctly for the blog backend, you should have dragged those files over, made a commit, pushed it up. Anybody have any problems with copied stuff over for the backend? Feeling good? Is it coming back to you a little bit? So this is kind of the bulk moving lots of files over. When we get into making uh, smaller changes to our code. Let's let's walk through um, a change um, real quick just to make sure that everyone feels comfortable doing this. Let's make a change to the back end. Um, and what I want is for everyone to make a change to their back end, the blog back end. I want everyone to make a change so that um, the API, the, sorry, the the route, the slash route, um, not slash blog, not any of the other API routes, but just the slash route. When someone hits that slash route, I want it to return your name. Um, so let's go dive into the code real quick and figure out how to do this. So to open up our code, we'll be, make sure we're here working on the blog backend. Let's all open up in VS Code. Right, and what I was mentioning is making a change to one of the API routes. Um, where should we go to look for API routes? Does anybody know? Does anybody know what API routes means? Endpoints? Is that in the server? Views? Yep, it's in the server. So can anybody tell me um, what the routes are in this blog? Mm -hmm. The, the server.get or post. So what are, um, so I'm gonna pick on you, Jennifer. Tell me what, tell me what one of the routes is. Um, like I've got server.get with a logout and a destroy um server get with a logout oh yeah logout is totally a valid a valid route um posts is a valid route um mm -hmm. so so when i say 
um, when I say, let's go make a change to the slash route, what do, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Home or rather home will be in the front end. I don't know about the back end. It would be in the back end. It would be in the back end. Line 20. 26. 26, exactly. This is slash, which means this is the uh, this is the highest level route in our back end. So there's slash login, there's slash forgot password, slash set password, et cetera, et cetera, uh, slash post, slash ID. Um, but let's make a change to this slash route. Instead of having it say hello world, let's hey, let's have it say, um, let's have it print our name. So let's switch this from hello to my name. So make some kind of change to this route. All right. After you've made a change to this route, how do we commit and push this change? We go back to our um, our GitHub. It shows the change we made. Exactly. So let's go back. Make sure we save. Go back to GitHub Desktop. GitHub Desktop is smart. It notices that we've made a change here. Let's make a commit. Say something like uh, root route to Commit. Push. How do people feel about that? Is it coming back a little bit? Making changes, pushing them. One of, one of the things we can do is we can also go and check out how GitHub looks. So if I go up to GitHub, I can see that if I go to server.js, Got my change up on up on GitHub. So all the changes that I'm making in my code are, are being mirrored up here on GitHub every time I push. Oh, that's a thing. Okay. Any any questions before we move on? Oh, we're kind of getting rate limited, but it's it's coming in in waves. So and now it's showing, now it's showing uh, some of the results for people's. Uh, but it looks like everybody has has a repo created. Great job. Um, anybody having problems making a commit to the back end? Can I pick on some people? I have a question, Nathan. Yeah. So, uh, how do I know that my change actually happened? So, like, where do I check again? So, I did commit, Maybe. but I don't know where the change happened. So, yeah, good question. So, let's go and look at your your backend. So, I'm going to click on your GitHub username. So, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at your username. I'm going to go and find your backend. So, I'm looking at your GitHub username slash blog backend. And I see that you made a change one minute ago, minute ago. I'm going to click on that link. Sure enough, there's your change. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm going to pick on Brandon. So did Brandon go with, uh, my name is, did he go with something, uh, something more creative? Oh, it went with the my name is Brandon. That's fair enough. Fair enough. Um, i go back to the page and see. I'm going to pick on one more person. Um, i pick on Schneider. Yeah, no. Blog, blog backend? Nothing yet? Okay. Are you no, doing good on the blog backend? No. Uh, my iCloud sync is slowing down everything. I was going to turn it off, but I can't turn it off because um, I work on my other laptop too. 
So oh. let's watch. Okay. All right. So um, I think this is a good point to stop and take a take a what should we do? Do a 20 minute and um, back at 705. Sound good? Okay. All right. See everybody in 20. Thank you. Okay, so we are now at the point where we have we have working code for the front end and the back end. Um, we practiced making a small change to the blog back end. Specifically, we made a change to one of the slash slash um, one of the slash routes just to practice practice making changes. Um, hey, Nathan. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry, Adi. I didn't do that because I realized when I uploaded my blog, I did it from like a week earlier than the completed one. So I went back to oh. correct that. But I didn't make that change. If you could just show me that real quick. I apologize. Yeah, no, you're fine. Um, in fact, I'm just going to make a change real quick on my end just to just to quickly show the process one more time. Um, okay. You don't have to make a change. It's not something that we're making. Uh, we're not making a change to uh, to like accommodate deploys or um, make any new functionality. Uh, but just to recap, uh, I'm working on the blog back end. I want to do make some changes to the code. I'm going to hit open in VS Code. Um, I'm looking at, I'm going to look at the server, uh, server JS, and I'm going to change the session secret from my secret key to LinkedIn secret password. Okay. Um, I saved, I'm going to go and look back at GitHub Desktop. GitHub Desktop notices that something has changed. Cool. Um, changing my session secret. Commit, push. And at this point, if I wanted to go see the change on GitHub, I could, I can. Um, I can either navigate to it in the browser, put the on GitHub. And we will see there is a commit that occurred just now. Click on that. Sure enough, I did change. I did change that line of code. Random All question. Right. Yep. The API key thing that you noticed earlier, something we got to worry about or no? Um, no, I think uh, I think Max would rotate that. Uh, okay. I think, I think we're good. If, if we're if we're not, we'll make sure that the YouTube video doesn't get put up until we know that we know that that's good. Um, in fact, just so everybody knows, we're going to be talking about a lot of API keys, and some of the API keys are going to have credit cards behind them. <clears throat> um, we need to be very careful with those uh, and make sure that they don't end up in the YouTube video. Uh, otherwise, we'll have some problems. And I have a story to share about uh, leaked API keys and running up bills, uh, right. So at this point, the next logical question is, what about our capstone? Um, I'm gonna leave that to you. I do have a couple recommendations though. Just follow, follow what we did in class. Make a front end, make a back end. If you don't, if you, um, feel free to be, um, feel free to call it. Capstone front end, capstone back end. Um, keep it simple. Uh, capstone front end, capstone back end. Create the two repositories. Link them up with your GitHub desktop, just like we did. All the slides are here for you to check out. So, um, so uh, feel free to do that on your own time. We've got to kind of jump a little bit ahead um, with the with the blog example. But um, for your capstone, do the same thing. Take whatever. Whatever code you have for your capstone, get it divvied up into um, into the two folders and get it um, get it into GitHub. If you have any questions um, about that, um, I'm thinking we'll probably do an office hours this week, this weekend, and next. So if you've got questions or you're not able to get your files moved over, um, feel free to to come and bring your your examples. Then sound good. All right, let's get on to the, the actual meat and potatoes of 
of this week. So we're going to quickly talk about deployment platforms. We talked about this back in week seven a, a little bit. Um, but I just want to kind of remind people why we're doing what we're doing, not really just, uh, I don't want to just shove a bunch of technology in your face and say, you must use this. Um, there's there's some rationale behind this. And there's a, a plethora of choices. If you want to get your capstone, um, if you want to get your capstone in front of uh, in front of customers, in front of other people, um, there's there's not one right way. I'm going to show you a way of doing this. Um, so we're going to quickly do an overview tonight, and then we're going to start getting into a little bit of how to use Amazon Web Services. Um, but our goal really is kind of broken into three big milestones. We've got the front end. It's going to take some, some work to get our front ends deployed. Um, we've got the back end, and then, of course, we have the database. Um, and I kind of break the database out into its own thing because the database is a little bit complicated, so we're going to need some time to talk about that. At the end of all of this, if we have all the pieces set up correctly, we should be able to do a full, what I'm calling a round trip. We should be able to open up the website in a browser, make a call from the browser to the back end. The back end will probably make a call to the database, and from the database, it will return back. Um, so we're going to try to make a, a full round trip. Um, I, I keep saying try. We are going to do these things. We will achieve them. All right. Can anybody remind me why if we need to um, why we need to deploy our code? I mean, what what's the alternative here? What what have we been doing on our uh, as we work on our code? Either live share or since we're doing React, npm start it and check it out through the browser. Yeah, exactly. You've been you've been running npm start, which is what does npm start do? I think it opens a local host, I think. Yeah, it starts up a server. Um, it starts up a development server. When you run npm start um, on the front end, it starts um, it starts Webpack, which is the front end uh, dev server. Um, and then um, when you run npm start or npm run um, when you do that on the back end you're starting up the node.js server um, in both of those cases that server lives on your computer it's um, local to your machine i can't reach it unless you do some crazy stuff like opening up ports on your um, on your router and um, all kinds of stuff but normally i can't reach it your neighbor can't reach it. Certainly customers can't reach your, your website um, when it's on your computer. That's why in week seven, we did the GitHub pages so we could push up our stuff to, uh, to a website and be able to, to share our portfolio with others. So I'm kind of asking the same question that we asked back in week seven. You know, why, why do we need to deploy our code at all? Why isn't our laptop good enough? So it doesn't crash. Right. Same same thing, same thing we said before. You know, our, our MacBooks are really not efficient, um, aren't, aren't, aren't efficient machines for running 24-7, um, serving lots and lots and lots of users. Um, and really our MacBooks are kind of prone to um, uh, our MacBooks are, are used for different things than um, than enterprise grade servers. So um, there's also, you know, we talked a, uh, quite a bit in week seven about uh, the security aspect of it. You know, Macs aren't really designed for being put out on the internet for anybody to, to be able to reach. They're really meant more for personal computing. Um, so they're not, uh, they're just from a security perspective, they're not really meant to do the same thing. Um, but I'm not gonna reiterate week seven. Um, let's let's just keep jumping ahead. So. Uh, if you recall, there is kind of different tiers of hosting based on how um, based on how um, how do I say this? Because I don't I don't want to say that you were I don't want to say that uh, that we were dealing with simple stuff in week seven. There's different tiers of hosting based on how complicated your your app is. Um, 
the simpler your app is, the um, less complicated of a product that you need um, to deploy it. Um, the more comp once once you start getting into um, writing JavaScript, backend JavaScript, um, databases, uh, so on and so forth. Once you start getting into the more complex side of software engineering, these um, these file hosting services don't really work as well. Um, GitHub Pages is file hosting. GitHub Pages takes some HTML, some CSS, JavaScript, and um, it serves it on the internet. That's great for, um, for simple websites, but it leaves out the more complex stuff like running a backend language like Node.js and, and databases. So all the stuff that you kind of see on the screen really isn't going to be enough for, um, for hosting the whole capstone. So we kind of have to look beyond just, just we have to look beyond just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript because, um, again, it leaves the question of what are we going to do about uh, the extra uh, technologies that we've acquired. So, so then we move on to the next tier up. So if file hosting is sort of the simplest, we move on to the next layer, which is application hosting. And um, application hosting, there's quite a few. Um, Google App Engine um, will take backend languages and run it for you. DigitalOcean has an offering. Heroku is actually what, um, what we used to teach. Um, we used to use Heroku as the application hosting. They would take your code and just run it for you. Um, it was pretty neat, um, but uh, but they um, uh, they have stopped offering uh, some of the products that they they used to offer. Um, so we have to look um, from from a perspective of of what we actually need in order for our capstones to to get deployed we have to kind of move from having this uh, static set of files to um, a full application hosting we need to be able to run um, our code 24 7 as opposed to here's here's some static files um so aws this is what we're going to we're going to be talking about the next couple of weeks and what we're going to be practicing doing our deploys with um, it is the missing, uh, it, it is the platform for uh, serving these kind of complicated pieces, the Node.js backend and the, uh, the Postgres database. Um, it will be able to handle these very, very easily. And so to kind of clue you into why we're going with AWS, um, it really boils down to two really big things in my mind. Um, the first one is that AWS is, uh, AWS really is miles and miles ahead of the competition in terms of features, uh, market share, number of customers. Um, all of that really doesn't mean a whole lot to us just kind of as regular software developers, except for the fact that it means that there's a whole lot of tutorials on the internet on how to use AWS. There's not as many tutorials on the internet on how to use Oracle or Google Cloud or any of the um, uh, the smaller uh, vendors. So by going with AWS, we're kind of uh, hopping on the bandwagon a little bit and getting um, getting a wealth of information um, just because so many people have have gone down uh, this trodden path of using AWS. The other thing to be aware of is that AWS is basically everywhere. Um, the 31 geographical re regions, um, you can see right there, there's a number of data centers in the US and all across the world. Um, so there's really, there's really not a location that um, exists that you aren't able to uh, deploy your code to by using AWS. Anybody have any questions so far about AWS or the different tiers of, um, of application hosting. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to sign up for accounts on AWS. And uh, the first thing that we're going to do is 
Uh, here is a link to get to the AWS page. Uh, I will copy that and paste it here in the slides. Or sorry, in the chat. Now I'm already logged in, so I'm going to sign out and then log back in. Now I'm going to walk through this, uh, walk through this with you. So for the root user email address, this should just be your personal email address. So I'm going to make And then for the account name, you can call this whatever you want. Um, I'm just going to use my first name for the account name. And then go ahead and verify your email address. Pop open my email over here on the side. Make sure that you save your password somewhere that you can easily remember what it is. I'm using a password manager. That's what you see popped up on the screen here. Oh, and because everybody on the call just saw it, I'm going to stop showing you my password. Okay, so after you get past that, moving on to the contact information, we're going to switch this to personal and then fill in our details. And then uh, I'll meet you at the end of this step. Okay, and you should get to a billing information screen. So let me talk talk through um, what kind of billing we're expecting to, to have happen here. So AWS offers us a bunch of stuff for free. Um, we are going to probably spend close to $3 uh, throughout this whole process. So um, the little message that you see over here on the left, um, we're going to mostly be using the AWS free tier in order to get all that stuff for free, but there will be a couple um, very small charges that pop up. Um, all of those charges are eligible for being reimbursed through uh, careers and code. So, um, so go ahead and throw in a card uh, for this and, um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can ensure that uh, we don't spend more than a couple bucks um, because there are controls in place um, for ensuring that. I'm going to go ahead and take this off screen again to fill in my credit card.
All right. And then I'm at the point where I'm going to get a verification code. Anybody have any problems getting to this? Hey Nathan, when we say how we plan on using this, should we put personal or business? Personal, please. All right, thank you. All right. And then when you get to the support plan, just go with basic support. We're not going to pay for TAMs or anything. Complete sign up. Now, this usually just takes a couple of seconds, but, um, but AWS creates the account um, and there is just a little bit of latency. So please be patient. And when um, when the account is created, you should get an email. Uh, I'm going to go check my email. And here's my email. Thank you for creating an AWS account. For the next 12 months, you'll have free access to all services within the limits of the free tier. So let's go quickly look at what free tier uh, offers. If you're still working on signing up, no, no big deal. Um, I'm just gonna talk through this real quick for educational purposes. So uh, the way the AOS free tier works is they have some things that are always free. So if you rent servers that are uh, of a certain type, um, it doesn't matter if you're a new customer or with it, if you're within the 12 month um, enrollment period, it doesn't matter at all. Some things are just free. Um, and I'm gonna try to do my best to, to point those out because um, there are a few things that uh, are, are just nice to know that you, you can always have those for free. Then there's some that are uh, only free for 12 months. So since we just signed up today, um, obviously in 2024, uh, February of 2024, uh, some of those things that might have been been free for us may no longer be free. Um, that's specifically true for um, EC2. EC2 is what we're going to use to um, provision our servers, to rent servers. Uh, and again, there's certain kinds of servers that you can pick that are um, within this 12-month free uh, trial. And again, I will do my best to, to point those out. Um, but if you come to this page, the, the link that you got in your email, I'll also paste this here into uh, the chat. If you wanna check that link out and see what I'm seeing on my screen. Um, there are, uh, a, there's a breakdown of all the things that you can get for free and the stipulations that come with them. Um, like for example, DynamoDB is one of uh, Amazon's uh, uh, proprietary databases, kind of like Postgres. We're all uh, familiar with, with how to use Postgres. Uh, Dynamo, DynamoDB is one of Amazon's um, database types, uh, and that falls under the always free. So regardless of whether you're within the first 12 months, um, there's a certain number of operations that you could do on, the, on their database, and it will always be free. Um, so that's kind of what the always free, uh, always free tier and then the 12 months free tiers do. Um, again, we're going to leverage both of these um, as best we can to, um, to uh, 
make sure we don't incur any costs. Um, all right, now that I've done uh, Blab, and I'm going to assume that that has given AWS enough time to create our accounts. So let's go ahead and try signing in. Um, to sign in, um, there's a link here on the slides. Uh, alternatively, you can just go to um, the console by Googling AWS console. Oh, mine's asking for a credit card. Sorry? Did mine be asking for a credit card? Yes. Yes, it should be asking for a credit card. Um, we're probably going to spend like on the order of one to three dollars uh, over the next two weeks. Um, so we need to have a credit card for like a, a couple of the small charges that we might incur. Yeah, no, that's no problem. I just didn't know if we were supposed to do that. Yep. And again, um, this is this is going to be one of those things to um, to throw onto the reimbursements for careers in code. Um, I don't expect us to go much beyond single digit dollars if we do everything right. Um, okay, that link that I clicked on, I'll paste that into uh, into chat so that we are all able to get to it. So this is the sign in page. There's two options here, root user and IAM user. We created our accounts using the root user. So I'm gonna sign in uh, using that. Um, I need to go look up my email. And then uh, it should ask us for a password. And if all is well, you should see a screen like this. Anybody not able to get into their AWS account? So um, is there a way you can change it from company to personal? Uh, I have to make a new account again. I don't think so, but honestly, you could just go with it. I don't know what changes. Uh, I don't know what the difference is. It's it's probably the same. Okay. You might not get access to the free tier is the only concern I have, but uh, just just go with it. And gotcha. we'll we'll find out if you don't have access to the free tier. <laughs> Careers in code will find out if you don't have access to the free tier, I should say. If if for some reason we don't fall within the free tier, which we all will, but if for some reason we don't fall within the free tier, um, um then we're talking about spending 10 to $13 over the next couple of weeks, which um, is, not, is not a big deal considering that uh, careers in code will reimburse us. So um, if you could see this page, you're good. Um, if you aren't able to see this page, uh, please let me know because we all have to be able to log in in order to work the next couple of weeks. Okay, so I have one thing that I want all of us to do um, uh, before we call it for today. Um, there are a number of different things that you can do in AWS. I'm gonna show you how to navigate uh, around a little bit. The search box up here is your friend. Um, if I say something like, we're going to go and look at AWS S3, what does that mean? Well, that means go up into the search box here and type in S3. You'll see that, uh, that in this services page, there will be a bunch of stuff pop up. Amazon is a collection of 100 plus different products. Um, and um, people combine those products in, uh, in a, a bunch of different ways. Um, so we're gonna go through a few of these products. The first one we're gonna, we're gonna look at is called IAM and we're going to create an account. Uh, actually, we're gonna create an account for me in everyone's uh, AWS account. Um, but uh, when I say go and visit AWS S3, go and visit AWS um, IAM or AWS CloudFront or AWS DynamoDB, AWS Elastic, Beanstalk, 
If I ask you to go visit AWS something, that means come into your account, go up to the top and, uh, and look it up, look up that product name um, up here in the top bar. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna look at is called IAM. So in the box, type in IAM. And what we wanna do is click on the IAM service. You should see something that looks similar to this. The, um, what we're going to do is to help make the next, uh, to help make the following classes a little bit easier is I'm gonna ask you to add me to your account. And the reason why is because um, if anybody needs any help, uh, I'll be able to help you a little bit better if you invite me to your project. Um, the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna come into IAM which handles all of the users, all of the, um, all of the uh, service accounts. It handles all of the uh, permissions uh, for people that are um, working in your AWS project, in your AWS account with you. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here and we're going to create a login for me to be able to access, uh, access your account. After we're done with, um, after we're done with, uh, the capstone, or really when we're done um, next week, you can remove me. Um, you don't need to keep me in here long term. Okay, so to add me to your account, let's go to the next slide page. We're going to create a user. You can click on these links if you don't want to navigate, uh, navigate with me through the uh, AWS page. You can click on these links um, yourself, but um, I'm going to just do it here directly. So over here on the left, there's a users page. I'm going to click on users. And we're going to create an account for Nathan. So click on add users up here in the top right. The username, call the username Nathan. Well, actually, I don't care what you call it. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to call me something else, feel free to. Um, just throw in a name for the user, click next. And then on the next page, it's gonna ask you, okay, so you're inviting this user, what do you want them to be able to do? What are the permissions that you want them to have access to? So we're gonna click the attach policies directly. And under the permission policies, um, it's actually right here, administrator access. You could also type it in and filter, uh, filter to it, but uh, just check that administrator access box. So you're granting this user permission to um, administrate uh, the account. And then just hit next. And that's it, create user. So you've created an account, you've created an account for me. So if, if you've done it correctly, you should just see what you have one user, um, and that's it. Anybody have any problems creating a Nathan user? You might just walk me back through it. Uh, so username Nathan, provide user access to the AWS Management Console? Um, you don't have to. Um, in fact, I, I wouldn't um, check that box. Just, uh, just click next. Yep, just click next. And then uh, click the attach policies directly. Okay. It'll give you a whole bunch of policies that you can give me. Uh, you should see administrator access. Check that box. Um, administrator access. Yep. All right. Once you have that checked, just hit next, create user. All right, so if you've got a Nathan user, um, the next thing to do is to click on the Nathan user. I need a way to get into, into, this, into this user. So to give me the ability to log in to this Nathan user, click on the Nathan user and then click over on security credentials. So you as the, uh, the account administrator, 
you're provisioning credentials for me to be able to log in. So over on the security credentials tab, it's right here in the middle of the page. Click on security credentials, and then I want you to create an access key for me. So down here where it says access keys zero, no access keys, click create access key. And then when it says, okay, what kind of access key, click the command line interface. And then it says, uh, make sure you know what you're doing. Just check the box and say, yes, I wanna proceed with creating an access key. And then it will ask you to give it a tag and just ignore, ignore that. I'm actually going to hide my screen because on the next page, it's going to show some, some stuff. Um, so let me take this off real quick. Go ahead and click the create access key. And then there should be a download CSV file. And I will share my screen here in a second. There we go. Okay. So after you create the access key, let me show you what it should show on the screen. So you should see something that looks kind of like this. have an access key section and then a secret access key. And then you should see a download CSV file. I don't care how you do this. I need to know these things. So I need you to send me a Slack message that contains both of these, uh, both of these values. You can either copy these and send them to me over Slack, or you can download the CSV file and send me the CSV file in Slack. I don't, I don't care um, which, which you do. Um, but I need uh, I need both of these, the access key and the secret access key. Are you uh, Nathan E on Slack? I am, yes. Okay, just making sure, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing real quick and then checking out Slack. Cool, thank you, Brandon. Got it, Jordan. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys not sending me CSVs. Like, you don't, you don't realize how, how happy I am to not be downloading CSVs and opening them. Thank you. I uh, got it from you, Jennifer. Thank you. Oh, Sh Schneider, can I get, uh, can you? paste the values into Slack if you still have that screen up. Uh, Kalai, I got yours. Thank you.
Nathan, I'm going to go and help Patrick catch up real quick. Sounds good. Naj, I got yours. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for trying this out, Doug. Thanks, Schneider. I appreciate it. Make the copy paste. Well, I got yours. Thank you. And Brian, I got yours. Thank you. And Alba, I got yours. All right. Did you get mine, Nathan? Uh, Archal, yes, I got yours. Thank you. All right, cool. I was just sure you said my name. All right, thank you. Let me make sure I don't have any of these on my screen. And then... Should be good to go. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for doing that. Now, uh, what's time? So, what you sent me is very, uh, very sensitive, right? You just gave me administrator access to your account, which has your credit card linked to it. Um, so what could I possibly do? Well, uh, I could, theoretically, I could go and spin up 40, 50, 60 something uh, GPU enabled servers in Poland or uh, anywhere uh, in the world. And I could start racking up a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of uh, charges on your account. Uh, am I going to do that? No, absolutely not. Um, I, I, I'm not going to not going to do that to you. But the, the point that I want to make is that um, those credentials are uh, very sensitive. So make sure that you don't accidentally share them with someone that you don't uh, you don't intend to share share them with. Um, uh, in fact, the people that sent me their uh, that have sent me keys, if you want, go into Slack and delete the messages uh, that you sent me. So Slack doesn't have a record of those keys. Um, but just be be very careful with those access keys because if they fall into the wrong hands, bad things can happen. Such as uh, what happened to me uh, back in 2017, um, I accidentally had my keys get leaked and I had hackers run up uh, a $3,700 uh, bill on my AWS account. This is a screenshot of correspondence with uh, AWS where I was where I was absolutely freaking out because uh, I woke up in the morning and saw that uh, my uh, I was I, I saw that uh, my charges on the AWS account were um, were insane. Um, they ended up they ended up refunding me the uh, the amount that the the hackers um, the hackers spent on my AWS account but uh, just just be aware that uh, just be aware of uh, how important it is to keep your account secure and to prevent uh, and to prevent keys like the ones that you shared with me from from getting leaked. Question: You say yeah. hack is that a problem on your end or your end? Uh, hackers, uh, Bitcoin miners were the ones that uh, that did this. The, uh, I didn't have I didn't have MFA on my account. And I was using a relatively insecure password. Um, so um, that's how they got in. Gotcha. Um, so to make sure that you're not doing, uh, you're not falling into the trap that I fell into, let's quickly go and secure uh, all of our accounts using multi-factor authenticator. This is going to help us um, well, this is going to help us with a lot in terms of security, but the big thing is it's going to require um, it's going to require hackers to have uh, additional knowledge of uh, of a one time password. Um, so let's go and quickly put MFA on our accounts. Um, 
does is anybody not familiar with one time passwords? In this day and age, I'm sure mo most people are, but I just want to check. Everybody here heard of a one time password? Like for bank logins, like they're all they're they're fairly common. Okay, um, so let's go in and sign uh, and create a, a MFA. Let's create a multi-factor authenticator for our accounts. Here is the link. I'll copy this. This will get you directly to the page. It's in oops. In Zoom chat. So if you click on that, it will take you to. Well, it will take you back to IAM. So from here, you can click on this assign MFA device. So I'm going to go ahead and click on assign MFA device here. It's in the middle of the page. And I'm going to create a, I'm going to create an authenticator app for. Uh, for my account. So the device name could be whatever you want. I'm going to say, like, this is my phone. Um, order. So I'm going to use an app on my phone to, to store the, uh, the authenticator. OK. And then you can use whatever app um, you're comfortable with. I'm going to use uh, Google Authenticator. Does anybody does anybody not have an Authenticator app? Jennifer, okay, we got a couple people. So, um, the name cheap one is that the same thing? The name cheap one. Yeah, we did the authentication for Namecheap when we got our domain names. What did you use um, to? An authenticator app on the phone. Yeah, so um, I'm I'm on iPhone. I'm going to download the uh, Google Authenticator app. I can't quite see that. The Google Authenticator. Yeah, yeah. If you go to the, if you go, it's in on Android and on iPhone. But if you go to the app app store and look for an app called Google Authenticator, oh, now I remember it. Mm -hmm. There's Google Authenticator. There's Authy. Um, One password uh, will handle it. Um, Duo, uh, there's all, all sorts of apps that will store these one-time passwords for you. But uh, I've got Google Authenticator on my phone, so it's asking me to scan a QR code to get started. And I'm gonna sh look at this QR code and scan it. Now I've got some numbers on my phone that I'm gonna fill in. <clears throat> Excuse me. I haven't been able to get to that screen. So when it asks for the device name, you just put phone? Yeah, I just put phone in there. It doesn't matter what you call it. And then click next. Yep. I'm sorry, Nathan, where do we go to start this? I was helping Patrick. Yeah, no problem. Um, so there's a link in Zoom chat, but it's also um, on the slide. I'll paste it again in case you aren't able to I see it. it. Oh, OK. Uh, once you go to that link, I'll back up. Once you go to that link, there should be in the middle of the page, assign MFA device. Do you see yep. that? Click that. And then we're, we're all we're doing is we're creating a one-time password um, with our phones. So if you're familiar with, uh, with all that. So just um, in the device name, call it like phone or something. And then we're gonna create a, an authenticator app, login. Assign MFA. Yeah. Yep. I don't remember how to do this in the authenticator. So do, uh, do you have the authenticator app pulled up on your phone? Um, yeah, but you have to download on. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm not muted. Hold on. Mm -hmm. So once you have it on your phone, it should say like get started or something. Do you see that? 
I'm on a main page and it shows two of my accounts. Oh, you already have stuff in Google Authenticator? Looks like I do. Oh, cool. Okay. So um, let's see. There's a plus button. If I add that, what kind of account am I adding? Uh, scan a QR code. Hmm. Are you using the Google Authenticator app? It just says Authenticator. Oh. Maybe that's not the yeah, that's. I think the Google Authenticator app does just say Authenticator. It's actually really hard to see that it's Google. But if if it has like a, I'm trying to see. I just closed it. Lock with a little what, person. Yeah, that's. I think that's that's the Google Authenticator. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's a blue. It's a blue lock with a with a, the humanoid type shape in it. So oh. just go to that, Jennifer. When you sign in, and then there's a plus button on the top right corner, that should say like uh, add account. Um. I did personal account and then choose the QR code choice. The Google one is in blue though. Yeah, I got white. Yeah, Are the you Google using... one is like a gray thing with a G, like a gear symbol for Google. Oh, I don't, I mean, I'm just using Authenticator. I heard like Google Authenticator. I'm gonna be hundred percent honest. I don't even know who makes Authenticator. I was referring to that app specifically. Um, that's the one I have. Jennifer, is that the one you have? Is your, does yours say Authenticator at the top? It does. Okay, so that's the one that you have. So yeah, and that one and the, that one will work for this. You just have to go, once you get to the home screen where you see authenticator and like a little like uh, magnifying glass on the far right, there's a plus sign. Oh, okay. Um, you I see that, it. click that, click personal account and then add QR code for that. Y'all are using the Microsoft authenticator. That's the mix up here. The Microsoft authenticator is like the blue lock with the person in the middle, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm sorry for the confusion. It, it doesn't matter. Like either one of them will work. Um, either one of them will, will be able to scan the QR code and give you a number. So whichever one you end up going with, uh, after you scan the QR code, you should have some numbers popping up. Uh, in order to finish the registration on AWS, you need to put two consecutive numbers in there. So um, fill in the numbers for one of the codes and then um, wait until it refreshes and fill in uh, the second fill in the second code. And then once you have that, you should be able to hit add MFA. And now you have, uh, your account is protected. So whenever you log in, it's going to ask you not only for your password, but also for a, a code from this app. So you'll open the app and um, and fill in, a, fill in the, the number there. Nathan, it says yeah. my authentication codes are not valid. So um, there's a couple of options. The first thing you can do is just go and create another MFA code. Um, okay. So I'm going to do that with you. Uh, from this page, if you've already created one, um, just remove it. Uh, in my case, I'm going to create another one. All right. Uh, so have you clicked to show QR code? Do you have the QR code up on screen? Uh, yeah. So uh, you want me to go to the previous page in the AWS, right? Yes. I, I because uh, it already created one in my phone. I deleted that one, so I have to create delete. Yes, please. Okay. Um, this entity already exists. Entity already exists. You sh uh, do you mind sharing your screen? Ah, uh, sure. Okay. Before you share your screen, make sure you don't have any of those security credentials that you pasted to me in Slack. Sure. Make sure none of those are showing on the screen. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Go ahead and click cancel. Let's stop the setup. 
All right, let's assign another MFA device. Yep. Yep. Call it phone or whatever you want. Next, yep. Show Can I just let you know that phone authentication is the bane of my existence? Hey, hey, I'll, I'll give a spiel for one password. You don't have to do this on the phone. Like, uh, you can have it just auto complete for you. Blizzard made come me. Hate that. Come, come to office hours. I'll show you the easiest way to handle one time passwords. Okay, so I just need to uh, add both the numbers which follow, right? Yep. So scan the QR code, and then uh, add some numbers. Uh... And then, uh, wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. So we need to enter in two consecutive codes. So when you scan this current QR code, um, that's the number that you put in the first box, right? Yes. Okay. And second wait number pop in immediately. Oh, it did? Okay. okay. It did, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank Very you. nice. Yeah. <laughs> was about to trip it up for you. Very nice. Yeah. It just came uh, in faster. That's why I didn't realize that numbers came and left already. So. Nice. Yeah, um, I, I'm getting... Oh, sorry. I, I'm getting um, authentication code for device not valid as well. Um, are you using a phone app? For I am. I'm using Google... Authentic authenticator. Okay. Do you want to share your screen? Sure. Nice. Okay. Um, so you've scanned it. Right. Yes. And okay. then I was like, I was like, how do I cancel this and start over? So I hit a plus and now I've got two six digit numbers that keep refreshing. Uh, so hit, hit the plus. Yep. Do the scan a QR code. Let's just make sure that we have the one that's on screen. Now I've got three numbers. Counting Are they out. all the same numbers? Nope. Three different numbers. I know the last two. The last two are the same. Hey, Doug. Yes. My phone accidentally scanned the one that Nathan was showing on his screen, and that was causing me an issue. So what I did, I have an Android, so I pressed and held the the digit number that was coming up, and I deleted both of them. Then I rescanned what was on my screen. One authentication code popped up. I put that in first, and then when the second one came up after that. I added that in, then I was able to get in. Huh. I'm when I press and hold on the code, it it doesn't give it just says copied. It doesn't give me the option to delete it. At the top of the screen, it should show a um like a garbage can icon. Is it is there any risk in showing my code on on screen on camera? No, but the the two numbers that you see that are the exact same. Yeah. Throw that into code one. Doug, can you see my my can you see uh oh right. it's got the garbage yeah. can icon? Yeah. Yeah, mine doesn't have that. I got this. All right. You um, just need try, to highlight it. Yeah. Yeah, try to highlight it again. I like it and you get the trash can next to it. So no so tap it again and then press and hold and then you should get the icon in the upper right. I don't think that that works on iOS. Uh, oh, you have that's Android. why I mentioned I had an Android. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. No, I'm using the, I'm using the uh, uh, Google Authenticate on iPhone. Uh, so you said take the take the two that are the same and try entering those. Try entering try entering one to the first box. Yep, and then when it refreshes, uh, when it when it cycles, yep. Oh, nice. that time it worked. So Doug, 
two, um, so obviously you know now that the two that are the same are the good ones. Um, so to get rid of, get rid of stuff up in the top, top right, there's uh, two oh, little triple dots. Menu. Yeah, yeah. click the edit. And then whichever one wasn't right of the three, uh, probably the topmost one, I'm guessing, click that pencil and then there's a trash icon. Got it. Thank you. And I'm, I'm assuming you can delete one of the other ones too, if you don't want the duplicate. Cool. Hey, that's that's pretty much it for tonight. I just wanted to um, I wanted to make sure that we had. Uh, actually, let me uh, let me take the screen share real quick before uh, before I take over. Though, does anybody else has, did anybody else have problems getting uh, getting MFA on their device? Um, so before I let you go, I don't want to I don't want to forget about these these two things. Um, there is a billing page and some billing alerts, and um, we're not going to do that um, tonight. But uh, feel free to check these out. Um, the billing page specifically is nice because it tells you how much you've spent so far. We should have nothing because we really haven't done anything other than securing our account and creating a Nathan user. Um, but the other page, the billing alerts page, is really helpful because you can set up alerts to tell you when you've spent a certain amount. Um, for example, if you click on the uh, billing alerts uh, link in the slides, you can set up a alert to tell you if you've spent a single penny. Um, you can get an email um, as soon as AWS uh, recognizes that um, you've spent any money outside of uh, the free tier limits. So feel free to come in here and create um, an alert um, using that zero spend budget. And that's just kind of a great way of being able to tell um, uh, how much is actually getting spent. Now, I'm, I'm gonna make sure that we don't spend a bunch of money um, doing uh, deploying our capstone, but, um, but if you're feeling like uh, you wanna have more control and ensure that there's there's no kind of spend occurring. Uh, feel free to come in here and create this. How did you get to um, that page? Uh, to reach that page, you can click through it um, from the slide. Otherwise, I'll paste a link here in uh, Zoom chat. Nathan, this is the billing. Go ahead. I have a quick question. It's not about this, but um, if we're going to put our <clears throat> React code from our capstones into the GitHub um into the GitHub desktop and put everything in. Um we are still gonna be updating the code as we go, even though we have it in there, correct? Um so we're copying the code over into GitHub desktop. We're copying our code over into our repo. From yeah. that point on, we're going to do all of our work in repo. Okay. I, yeah, I know whatever. I, I know I already have my React code in there. I just need to bring my back end in. And are you talking about for the capstone? Yes. Yeah. I've been doing it in GitHub Desktop the whole time and upload and updating it as I go. I just need to bring my back end in because I don't have my back end in there. Cool. Yep. So let's think a, a good segue. Let's um, let's put a stop on the AWS stuff because that's where we'll pick up tomorrow. But um, for tonight and any time that you might have before class tomorrow, um, please create GitHub repos for your capstone. Create a capstone front end and capstone back end and start moving your code from your capstone into there. Um, it's going to... Uh, it's gonna be really helpful to make sure that in addition to the blog stuff we do during class, it's gonna be really helpful to make sure that um, you're following along and doing the same sort of stuff with your capstone. Um, uh, because uh, I want everyone to feel really comfortable with their deploys before, uh, before you go to show them. Um, 
if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask and, uh, and we'll make sure that, uh, that we have those capstones good to go. Any other questions before we, before we call it for tonight? I have a question like, so we can still upload the app filled capstone, right? So I don't have to wait till I finish completely. No, yes, please okay. uh, get okay. started now getting that capstone moved over. And the reason why we want to move it over now is because we're going to start doing our development inside of the repo as opposed to um, wherever you might have it already on your computer. Other questions or thoughts, concerns? Wait, we're going to be coding it inside the repo? We're going to, um, yeah, I mean, we're going to be making changes to the files inside of our repo. Heard. Cool. Well, if there's nothing else, um, we'll call for the night. And tomorrow, we're going to pick back up, and we're going to try to get our front end deployed. Uh, Do you have a Calendly link set up? <clears throat> I do. Um, and uh, if there's anything that you need between uh, between now and uh, uh, the end of class next week, yeah, feel free to uh, feel free to reach out. Um, and I can paste that. I can paste that link later. Otherwise, uh, I think that is it for tonight. Unless anybody has any other questions. Um, Cool. Have a great evening and uh, see you all tomorrow for doing some front end deploys. Thank you. Night, everyone. Good night, guys. Good night.